All right, folks, we are back here on WLTH. This DJ, B. Scotty, see you. Yes. Yes. And we are dealing with a, uh, a milestone, a large milestone. Our president, Joseph Robinette Biden. Robinette. Yes. Has reached 100 days in office. I ain't gonna lie. I didn't. I, didn't, I, I wasn't 100 percent sure that he'd get this far, <laughs> that he'd live this long, or, or they uh, would, you know, I know they want Kamala. Kamala's the one that they always wanted. Uh, but you know, he's 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 stayed there, and his his, his popularity is staying around 54 percent, 53, 54 percent, which is great for the world we live in today. Yeah, that's where everything is so. There was just a poll that came out that everybody's freaking out about on Twitter right now that. 70% of Republicans don't believe Joe Biden won the election fairly. 70%. So it so those people will never be happy with Joe Biden's. No. Um, but uh in his first hundred days, obviously he had to tackle the COVID pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Uh he came in office pledging to administer 100 million vaccine shots by his hundredth day in office after Trump fell short of his goal. To vaccinate 20 million Americans by the end of 2020, the Biden administration reached its 100 million shot goal in mid-March, about 40 days ahead of schedule. Yeah. Uh, the administration reached 200 million vaccines on April 21, a week ahead of Biden's updated timetable. Now, see, the good thing about that is what uh, they set the expectations extremely low. Like, it's you know, that's the good thing about having all your friends in the media yeah because like if if trump had let's just say if trump gets reelected, we'd probably be somewhere around here anyway yeah so but now you know biden gets in office and he could take all the credit for it but look i'm not gonna hate because look uh, to a large extent he america needed a steady hand you know somebody to make them feel you know like things are not falling apart and donald trump is too unstable yeah Even, i, I yeah. think that's that's really the biggest take away from this is not so much you know what does he accomplish what did he fail to accomplish it's just that the mood is different now right you know we're not going from pillar to post from crisis to crisis we are not from twitter tweeter to tweeter mm -hmm. you know we're just it's 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 almost like a typical presidency just right. the usual suspects the usual drama the usual situation I agree. <laughs> I absolutely uh, agree. And like, there is a value to that. Even though, I, like I said, I didn't vote for Joe Biden. I, I would probably will not vote for him if he runs it four years from now. Right. Being the, the candidate that he is. Uh, but I, 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 I do think that like, ultimately his, he's doing what the establishment wants him to do. Yeah. Do you remember when Gerald Ford was president? No. After the Nixon administration. No, that's before I was born, Ram. Okay. Well, right. this is that kind of situation. Okay. We had a crisis in the presidency, and now we've got a guy whose main task is just to get us through the next four years without a calamity. Right. If he can pull that off, now that doesn't mean he'll get reelected, just like Gerald Ford didn't get reelected. Mm -hmm. But if he can do that, he can restore confidence in the office. Right. And that's really all they need him to do. Right. Hey, we've got our first caller. Hello, caller. Hello, caller. Oh. Good afternoon. What's good up? Afternoon. What's up? How you doing? It's all good, brother. What's on your mind? Well, I'm just thinking, you know, like, um, you know when you're talking about, about uh, Ford, right? Uh, um, what, did the, what did the Congress force President Nixon to do? Sign the Clean Water Act, environmental protection. They did all kinds of things that you wouldn't expect from those type of folks. However, if you look at the real dichotomy, the real reality there, Mr. Nixon comes from poverty. Mm -hmm. He didn't come from a, a platinum spoon lined with diamond trinkets. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can't even compare them. The, the clown we had a minute ago, I'm sorry. The president we had a minute ago. Hey, I always yeah. called him a clown. <laughs> was totally, was to absolutely disrespectful to the notion of our constitution. I mean, come. I mean, look. Uh, I, 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 I wasn't it. trying to say that Nixon and Trump are comparable. It, it wasn't that. It was. No, no, it was I wasn't suggesting yeah. that. I wasn't suggesting that yeah. at all. 
I was just saying that we haven't had this announcement of change since since that time. I mean, we have been on a rock slide straight down since Reagan, in reality, unless you're in the market. Yeah. Right. And I mean, now, the, yeah, go ahead. Like, the only, I look, the, I mean, we are a constitutional republic, a democratic constitutional republic, okay? Mm -hmm. And you talk to most people, and they don't even know what the daggone Federalist Papers are. Mm -hmm. Let alone, now, how we can have a discussion with somebody about concepts, ideas, it's not about my how I feel. It's about the knowledge we have we're sharing with our friends. Hopefully, it will inspire some more thinking. Right? right? Right. Donald Trump's way, the way of the Republicans today, hey, you dummy, just shut the hell up and do what I said. That's the routine. I mean, when, when you... I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. no, no. What I was about... All I was going to say is that, like, the Democrats aren't... Like, like Donald Trump is just the most crass version of what the establishment already is. Yeah. That's the way I've always viewed him personally, as he's just a crass version of what they all are. Whereas they lie to your face. Donald Trump is just more of an honest representation of what the American government is. But is it, I, I, would you say it's maybe because he comes from a background where he's so detached from the issues of the, you know, the average electorate that it never occurs to him to lie about what he really <laughs> thinks because he's been untouchable for so long. Right. I right. think I think that I think that's more like it. He has no concept almost you know, almost no concept of this. And look he he fell into a, um a bowl of chicken noodle soup and all he's gotta do is put a straw out. He doesn't have to do anything except for tell you you're stupid or you're beautiful. Yeah. Hey let let me raise let me raise your emotions here. And change the subject so we don't have to deal with reality. Um, now, if, if you know, if you think about it, well, I, I, when I think about it, I, you know, we're dealing with the you know justice system, right? If on? we don't, if we can't have an honest discussion about what bigotry really is and how it supports racism, then you know, the whole thing is almost for naught. Because yeah. you can't correct the problem unless you understand the root of the problem. Right. And it's not about, look, slavery really started with the caucus people. I mean, before that, it was somebody else. Before, And you're talking about the Afro, the Afro slavery root market started after the end of the white slavery market. You know, around the 14th century, 15th century. Right. We, we had kings and we had kings and strongmen back then. Now we've got the idea of an enlightened society where people can actually use science to understand the things that were unknown before. Right. Okay. We, these guys are actually, let me digress for a second. I, I'm in a, I'm in a restaurant having breakfast with some, some, some uh, um, old, old Democrats who are quite conservative, a lot more than me. I'm like a almost a radical to them. But there's this fellow who's run for Congress a couple of times comes up to her table, starts talking about economics. I asked him if he knew Adam Smith. Yeah, that stuff don't matter. Do you know Kenyon? No, that doesn't matter. He starts talking about, you know, Mark Levine. And after Mark Levine, he starts talking about how, you know, that under Washington, under Washington, D.C. right now, the tunnels, the whole city's under, got those tunnels where the demonic people are sacrificing fetuses. I mean, a, uh, this guy believes this stuff. Well, I mean, look, th there's always going to be a certain amount of people who believe what they got to believe. But, hey, we got to go to this other college. This is an educated person. This is an educated person, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This I feel yeah. you, but we got to go to this other caller. Thank you for your call. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. Hello, caller. Hello, Mr. Scott. Oh, this it's Bill K. Hey, Bill. Hi, guys. How are you? I missed you. How you guys been doing? I'm, I'm keeping busy. Actually, really busy, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, how about, what about you, Bill? Shows. Um, I'm going to get a knee replacement, so I've been kind of busy myself. Mm -hmm. I missed a couple of your shows, which breaks my heart. Yeah, so we, we missed you. <laughs> the, um, well, the only thing on my mind today is even though um, the union movement was really clobbered with the air traffic controller situation back at the beginning of Reaganomics 40 years ago, mm -hmm. I 
people think, even though six and a quarter percent of the private workforce is organized, about 36 percent of government workers are. And certainly I'm disappointed uh, the Amazon workers rejected bargaining with the company. I mean, with all the faults you find with the union, one thing is you have a contract and that's something. It's better than nothing. And it has the ability of the union negotiator to sit as an equal across from the table with the company. That's really important. I don't think the younger ones realize how important parity is. Well, see, the, in Amazon, the, in, in Bessemer, Alabama, I mean, we we covered before, but we didn't cover it after because we've had some very busy news cycles with a lot of stuff going on. But Amazon tilted the scales so far in their favor, including you know, sending propaganda to people on their phones at home when they're at home sleeping, uh, putting anti-union propaganda on the toilets. Uh, they they would they actually uh, fixed the the stoplights so that they wouldn't they would only uh, they wouldn't give the the organizers enough time to talk to people at the stoplight. Like they they really went out of their way to to rig that that vote. Well, oh, you know though, but on the other side of that, I mean, I've. I li lived in Las Vegas for a long time, and I mean, when it was time for the union votes, there was there was always that push by the management to make that seem unappealing. Yeah, but Amazon. But the, come on. The thing is, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is, does the person believe that the union will be able to back them effectively? If they can't, if they can't make that argument, they lose. If what? they can make that argument, then all that other stuff becomes irrelevant. Jeff Bezos is the richest man on the planet. Yeah. And Amazon's the biggest company on the planet. Yeah. You know, they like he has unspeakable power. So maybe those people down in Alabama looked at Bezos and they looked at that union and they said, Who's got more who's got more juice? Yeah. You know, I mean, to a certain extent, maybe Bezos didn't even have to do all all that he did. Oh, he, he did all he had lot. to do was basically <laughs> say was all he basically had to say was, "Look, if you all vote union, I'll move the plant." Well, that and he kept and, and he could do it. Yeah, and he used his connections in the media and with politicians to make sure that people like Joe Biden did not lend too much support to. The union movement like joe biden talks about being so pro-labor and all this other stuff but obviously we'll talk about that later on but uh -huh. hey, go ahead bill go ahead I, I oh yeah uh you see the thing is there's nothing like a contract because mm -hmm. it gives you an actual legal foothold on things still you know when you go to the employer it's hat in hand if you don't have one anyway yeah. you look at it unions weaknesses you can't no union contract i felt organized can ever Stop a company from bringing in technology. In other words, if the company wants to bring in a robot, there's nothing in the contract I ever saw that the union said, no, you're going to eliminate a job with a, with a robot so you can't bring it in. That's the weakness the union has, that the company can technologicalize. Um, south of the Mason-Dixon, it's hard to organize down there. And I'm going to tell you why. Unions never had a really strong foothold in the South because of the myth of the individual independent person. There's something that goes around, and my experience was in Tennessee, a couple places I helped, a couple unions organize, is people said, you know, I'm a rugged individualist, I'll be judged on my labor, stuff like that. And you know, it's hard to talk to somebody when they're sold on that idea. You know, they said, I'm a very valuable person. You know, explain to them when it's time for you to go because of technology or because the company's gonna do what they're gonna do anyway. So if they decide to move a plant and they prove it a million times, they'll move it. And you may be the best workforce in the world. But if they say, I'll go to Mexico and move the plant there, you're out of business. The air conditioning company did. I could go down a million different things. Right. But there is a union movement going on without a union. Now, what is happening? Their shortage is in the bottom labor force right now. The fast food workers, truck drivers, people that are under a great deal of strain in our state for it. And I think in a way, younger people are recognizing one thing. Many times the only thing you have to sell is your labor. And that's your time and it can never be replaced. Um, the, what Reaganomics did is cause the individual to feel that they were a cog in the machine, that the most important thing was the company and its profits. Somehow magically there'd be this trickle down 
And of course, it never happened. It's just propaganda. But I think among the younger people, the vibe I get is the idea that, no, I'm just not going to work that job because you're not making it attractive to me. I can't live on the money you pay. The benefits are not good enough for me in case somebody gets sick or in case I got any problem. So there is a, I believe, uh, unspoken psychological movement amongst our workforce to say, no, I'm just not going to accept a low paying job because doggone it, my time is just as much valuable to me as Jeff Bezos is or Bill Gates or any of the oligarchs are. And that encourages me. Even though you may not have the a contractual umbrella of the union, the attitude is, I'm just like, my labor's more, uh, it, it, it should go for a higher price. You know, you guys bid constantly to uh, bid up prices to your stock. You buy them back, you do everything. Well, I got stock in me. And if all I can sell is my labor power, it's just as valuable to me as your stock exchange or your value of shareholder value, all the other stuff that they grade on Wall Street. And I'm encouraged by that. Now, you may not have a union umbrella like the government, but one out of, more than one out of three government workers recognize the value of a labor contract. Hey, Bill, I just had a thought. I would would like to see what you think about this. As we move more and more into an information and data-driven economy, does that make more likely that people will will go, you know, Lone Ranger? Because they they see all these success stories, you know, the Bezos and the, you know, Apples and stuff like that. And, you know, people doing these you know, apps and, you know, making money, making apps and stuff. Is that going to have an impact where just the mere fact that you don't really need a bunch of people to make a product anymore? Well, the thing is, people are standing up for themselves and saying, if you want to technologicalize, go ahead and do it. You're going to pay taxes and you're going to support me, too. You're going to have we're going to have government subsidies. We're going to have to make you pay for them, because if your goal is to eliminate jobs just to make profitability, then you're going to pay through the back door because you have no you don't necessarily own this whole world. And I'm just not going to accept the fact that I'm a peon and every day I go to bed and I can't pay my bills. I got sickness in my family. My self-worth is a lot more than that. People are waking up to the fact that they lives are meaningful. Well, I mean, you can't live in a society like we've been living where the corporate America decides your values. Because that's what's been done. You know that. In my lifetime, there has been, unlike the 50s and 60s, where the people felt they were more valuable. Now people are swinging back after two generations to the fact that regardless of what you guys do, we are valuable. And you're just not going to step on us. I mean, it's a feeling. And yes, there's going to be success stories. And certainly the corporations will play them up. I mean, news media does. What did Tim Scott say the other day? He's an American success story. Well, come on. You know, that's window dressing for the establishment. That's saying that, like, racism doesn't exist and institutional oppression doesn't exist just because I happen to be a U.S. senator. People aren't buying that rags to riches hell racial algebra as much as they did before. Absolutely. Students coming out of college with $150,000 in debt, and they're not going to work a job in what they went to school for or trained for. They're going to settle at a job. Then they're going to want to go out on their own, and they can't because they can't afford to. So then they're going to be a burden on the whole structure because they got to live somewhere. And certainly a loving family is not going to throw a, a young person out because they tried really hard and they just can't afford to support themselves independently. The value of human worth, I think, is beginning. That's the human capital to go up. And yet there is the examples of the independent entrepreneur, just like there's an example of great athletes. But how many millions participate in athletics and how many actually get paid for doing it and make a living to support their family? Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. You always well, you always bring the ruckus. You always I, bring the ruckus. Yeah, well, I want people to continue <laughs> to build up their self esteem, even if not they're not quite yet ready to be uh, belong to a union and understand how valuable a contract is. At least you can figure you're valuable yourself. And I'm going to listen and uh, continue your good work. Yes, as always. yes. Thank All you, right. Bill. Thank you, Bill. And uh, we got to go to our next segment.